Welcome, everybody, and welcome to the PC Writer and Poet Speaker Series, uh, our California Poet Laureate, Lee Herrick, and welcome to PC's National Poetry Month celebration. My name is Melissa Black. I'm in the English department, and I'm happy to have everybody here today. Um, National Poetry Month was begun by the Academy of American Poets in April 1996, and it celebrates poets' integral role in our culture and that poetry matters. I'm really happy to have all of us here to celebrate that idea together. Over the years, National Poetry Month has become the largest literary celebration in the world. Tens of millions of readers, students, teachers, librarians, booksellers, literary events curators, publishers, families, and of course, poets, marking poetry's important place in our lives. Um, to further celebrate the month, on April 27th at 1230, we will host a virtual open mic. So please watch for information on the college website. Take one of the cards off the table. Um, take a picture of the big poster there on the wall um, and mark your calendar for that. Today, we welcome California Poet Laureate Lee Herrick. The California Arts Council explains that over the course of a two-year term, the role of the California Poet Laureate is to spread the art of poetry across the state, to inspire emerging generations of literary artists, and to educate all Californians about the many poets and authors who have influenced California creative literary expression. Lee Herrick is a writer and professor who teaches at Fresno City College and in the MFA program at the University of Nevada, Reno at Lake Tahoe, Born in South Korea and adopted as an infant, he grew up in Modesto, California. Herrick served as Poet Laureate of the City of Fresno from 2015 to 2017, where he led local efforts to bridge communities and engage young people in expressing themselves through writing. Herrick's work has been published in many places, the Bloomsbury Review, Columbia Poetry Review, Berkeley Poetry Review, The Normal School, The Poetry Foundation, Ziziva, and many other publications. He's a contributor to many anthologies, particularly those that examine the literary flourishing of California's Central Valley. Herrick is the author of three books of poetry, Scar and Flower, Gardening Secrets of the Dead, and This Many Miles from Desire. Please welcome Poet Lee Herrick. Uh, thank you, Melissa, so much for the kind introduction. Um, and I'm very happy to be here at Porterville College. Before I read some poems and talk a little bit about the laureateship, um, can everybody hear me okay, I should ask? I'll, I'll do my best to project. Um, I wanted to just thank a few people. Um, Mallory, who, oh, she's here. Mallory, thank you, and Reagan, thank you for reaching out early and for having me. Um, I've been so happy to meet uh, the faculty and the staff here, and a special just hello. It's nice to see a former colleague, but now she's the president of Porterville College. Nice to see you, Dr. Habib. Thank you for being here. And um, for all of the students, I wanted to say, that uh, I was thinking about this Poetry Month poster. And if you look at the big one on the wall there, um, it says, we were all meant for something. That's a quote from the great Ada Limon, one of her poems. I, I keep thinking about that. I was thinking about it driving onto campus today because I was getting nostalgic because I went to a community college. I went to Modesto JC and I teach at a community college now. And at that time, you all might be a little bit further ahead than I was. You might have your major, you might have your purpose clearly defined. But for me, when I was at community college, I wasn't quite sure, but I did come to believe that sentiment, we're all meant for something. And I hope it's okay that I say this to you. Um, I, I believe there's greatness in each of you. I'm talking to the students here. Uh, and I hope that's not awkward. Y'all be like, I don't even know you. <laughs> <laughs> it might take a while to discover. It might be in a, a field or a major or a discipline or a career or some purpose that has yet to find you. But there is greatness in each of you. And I wish you all the best. I hope I get a chance to say hi to you. 
But if I don't, I'll be having good wishes for all of the students here, okay? Um, so I was appointed California Poet Laureate in late 2022, November. Um, I was telling uh, Melissa and Dr. Habib that the governor, uh, Gavin Newsom, walked into my classroom one day and with his wife, the first partner, Siebel Newsom, and a very large, muscular Secret Service guy with a weapon, probably, and an earpiece, walked in to um, tell me I was the new California Poet Laureate. And it's been a whirlwind ever since. It's been a joy, uh, it's humbling, and it's an honor to talk about poetry in, in this state. Um, been reading at colleges and literary festivals. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I read at a state prison. Uh, they're Californians too, if I may say. They are Californians too, and it was an honor to be there. Uh, this summer, the first partner has invited me to go on book tour with her. So uh, I'll be traveling with the first partner to some public libraries throughout California, working with kids and teens. And the theme I love that she's shaped for this book tour, it's about women and girls leaning into power and voice and strength and boys and men leaning into care. And I, I, I really like that idea. So that's a little bit about the laureate ship. Um, and I believe we're gonna do some questions. So I'll read for a little bit and I'm really hoping there might be questions um, if you'd like, okay? The first poem I'll read is titled My California. Um, I was born in South Korea and adopted and the town where I grew up was largely white and my family is, my immediate family is white too. I, I was raised in a white or Caucasian family. Um, and I often felt like a little bit of an outsider. And when I wrote this poem, I started to realize that this is my state too. You know, this is your state too. So kind of about things I'd seen or hoped for or imagined. It's called My California. Here, an olive votive keeps the sunset lit. The Korean 20-somethings talk about hyphens, graduate school, and good pot. And a group of four at a window table in Carpinteria discuss the quality of wines in Napa Valley versus Lodi. Here, in my California, the streets remember the Chicano poet whose songs still bank off Fresno's beer-soaked gutters and almond trees and partial blossom. Here, in my California, we fish out long noodles from the pho with such accuracy, you know we've done this before. In Fresno, the bullets tire of themselves and begin to pray five times a day. In Fresno, we hope for less of the police state and more of a state of grace. In my California, you can watch the sun go down like in your California. On the ledge of the pregnant 22nd century, the one with a bounty of peaches and grapes, red onions and the good salsa, wine and japche. Here in my California, paperbacks are free. Farmers markets are 24 hours a day and always packed. The trees and water have no nails in them. The priests eat well, the homeless eat well. Here in my California, everywhere is Chinatown, everywhere is K-Town, everywhere is Armenia Town, everywhere a little Italy, less confederacy, no internment in the valley, better history texts for the juniors, in my California, 
free sounds and free touch, free questions, free answers, free songs from parents and poets, those hopeful bodies of light. So that last line, hopeful bodies of light, this, I don't know if this story will relate to you, but I was on campus one day at Fresno City College and there was a student trying to get people's attention. She had a clipboard. She was taking a survey or something and she asked me, excuse me, can I ask you a question? And I was kind of on my way to a meeting and I was in a rush, but I, I said, sure, what, what is it? And she said, well, I'm taking a survey for my class. She said, how do you see students on this campus? It's a pretty good question. How do you see students on this campus? And something came to me right away. And I told her, okay, I'm going to tell you, but if this sounds weird, I'm, I'm an English professor. So she said, it's okay. She said, it's okay. What is it? What is it? I said, I see them as hopeful bodies of light. And she looked up at me and she went, ooh, that's good. Say that again. <laughs> um, so I was born in South Korea. Um, you know, I think I'll read a different poem first. Um, I wrote a lot of my latest book. It's called Scar and Flower. Um, in about a four-year span where there was just a lot of gun violence. Um, I'm not opposed to owning a gun, you know? Hunting, protection, fear. I get that. Massacres, shooting of innocent people, I'm very against it. And there was a lot of violence of that nature televised more in the news in the span of time. This is our way. Our country is rooted in violence, in my opinion. But I just couldn't shake some of these experiences that I was watching the news. This is a little bit of a heavier poem, but I just couldn't stop thinking about these, these shootings. Um, so... <clears throat> I also have a hearing condition, which I've just started talking about openly recently. And so this poem is a little bit uh, not linear. You'll, you'll maybe get the sense of that. So, <clears throat> sorry. It's called, um, What I Hear When I Hear You in My Head. Is the little whisper the aggregate sorrow, the father's heavy weeping as the son's heavy weeping. What I hear is your artistic response after the massacre, the family of clasped hands, black hands, brown hands, a small child whose brother never had a chance, who holds her father's tearful face and says, your eyes are like the moon, is what I hear when I hear you in my head this evening, your laughter like tiny harps. I hear your fatigue as another way to say deprivation. I hear recount, retally. A retaliation is what I hear when I hear you in my head. It's the grace, the charm, the dead, the boy, the dead boy, the boy who died because of the fear, the forest in the other man's heart, the gun, the heartbreak is the sound I hear. When I hear you in my head, it's how we each sigh with distinction, where fatigue meets fire, where we wake and wonder. If we all go out to a field tonight, sit by a fire, and say the most honest thing you've ever said in your life. Would any dead boy or girl reappear? Not like a mirage, but reappear. Not like a voice in my head, but a body in this room with flesh and bones, with his big smile and orange blossoms in his billowing hair. Um, so my wife, Lisa, and I have been driving a lot uh, all over the state. And I love visiting every city, 
large city, small town, wherever it is. And um, I love being on this campus just this morning. It's a beautiful campus, uh, a beautiful town. I'm asked this all the time when I'm traveling. What's Fresno like? What's the valley like? Um, I think it's beautiful, you know? You might agree or, or not, but I just think it's beautiful. Um, people working, farmland, agriculture, bounty, flowers, mountains. And then something I noticed, I don't know if I was expecting this or not, but I thought I'd read this poem because it made me think of it. I was pleased to see the rainbow flag hanging out here um, at Porterville College. So I think I'm going to read this poem. It's called Rose. As you can see, I value different experiences. I don't know if you can see that or not, but right. Um, I think it's one of the things college can do is expand us and how we see the world. In 2016, I was teaching in New York City and some students were very, very unsettled because just a month before that, there was a, a massacre, a shooting at an LGBTQ nightclub in Orlando called Pulse. And so I was co-teaching with a great poet, um, Amy Nezhukamatatil, and she had the students write a poem about a flower and so I jumped in and wrote one too. Uh, this is called Rose <clears throat> for Orlando. This sudden desire to bloom near the astonishing splendor of the swamp. There you are, unexpected and delivered grace, rose and botany, petal and lure. When the tourists leave, tell me if you get tired. Why are you the queen? In another country, you are not royalty. Tell me, Rose, about root, soil, wilt. I'm stealing a petal, and I know it's a crime. I want the petal to fly from this botanical garden to Orlando, where I cannot place a rose on any altar, but where I imagine 49 roses near a swamp in a park where even small children know, don't terrorize the birds. Let no person deliver terror in a park, in a school, in a dance club, no terror in a dance club. I want to be quiet. The roses admit they don't know why they bloom, but they do. The rose, its pulse, doing its loveliness in a time of disaster, dancing like the world was on fire. All right. Um, Can you handle one more heavy-ish poem? And then I'll shift it a bit. Okay, cool. Um, so I don't know my exact birth date. Uh, I was born in 1970, sometime late 1970. Um, I've never met my birth mother or first mother, as we call them, or first father or birth father. Mm. I recently met some very distant cousins through DNA testing, like fifth cousins, which was kind of amazing. I'm still close with my family. They live in Modesto and Ojai and Seattle. Um, and we're, we're close still, but uh, I'd never met biological family until maybe three years ago. Um, and even though it was a distant cousin, that was kind of amazing, you know. Um, but this poem I'm going to read is sort of with my birth mother in mind. And also, I think it's for adoptees everywhere. So it's kind of a love song for her, but also for adoptees. It's called How Music Stays in the Body. And... If you'll bear with me, I just want to, you can still hear me okay? Okay. Okay. 
how music stays in the body. Your body is a song called birth or first mother, a miracle that gave birth to another exquisite song. One song raises three boys with a white husband. One song fought an American war overseas. One song leapt from 14 stories high and like a dead bird shattered into the clouds. Most forgot the lyrics to their own bodies or decided to paint abstracts of mountains or moons in the shape of your face. I've been told mothers don't forget the body. I can't remember your face, the shape or story, or how you held me the day I was born. So I wrote 1,000 poems to survive. I want to sing with you in an open field, a simple room or a quiet bar. I want to hear your opinions about angels. Truth is, angels drink too. Soju spilled on the halo, white wings sticky with gin, as if any mother could forget the music that left her. You should hear how loudly I sing now. I imagine I got this from him or you, my earthly inheritance. I've become a ballad of wild dreams and coping mechanisms. I can breathe now through any fire. I know all the lyrics. I know all the blood. I know why angels howl into the moonlight. All right, so let me shift gears a bit here. You know what somebody told me the other day? And this was one of these depressing moments where I thought, I, am I getting older in that way too? Somebody said, nobody does crossword puzzles anymore. Do you know what crossword puzzles are? I'm talking to this side of the room. I'm talking to you. Okay, now maybe not in the book, but maybe on the, do you still do word games, word something? We're still, oh. Okay, good. <laughs> Somebody told me, oh, Lee, because I was reading this poem. It's about, a, it started off with a crossword puzzle that I started doing on an airplane. And she said, nobody does those anymore. Wow. So they used to have in the seat in front of you a magazine on the airplane, and there was a crossword puzzle, and two people had already started the crossword puzzle. And I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm going to start on it too. I mean, it was a long flight. Let's, um, and it just became a poem about thinking about other people's lives, you know, where are people going, where they've been, things like that. So this is called Flight. The, the in-flight magazine crossword partially done a corner begun here, scratched out answers there. One set of answers in pencil, another in the green. The woman with the green ballpoint knew the all-time hit king is Rose. And the Siem Reap treasure is Angkor Wat. And the woman, perhaps en route, to hold her dying mother's hand in Seattle, forgot about death for 10 minutes while remembering her husband's Cincinnati Reds hat while gardening after the diagnosis. Her handwriting was so clean. Maybe she was a surgeon, maybe a painter. No, what painter wouldn't know 17 down? Diego's love five letters. In a rush, her dying mother's voice came back to her, or maybe she was a Chinese adoptee, and her first mother's imagined voice said, Wo I need. At 30,000 feet, you focus on 33 across, Asian-American classic, 
the woman. When a stranger in the window seat sees the clue and watches me write in W, and she says, warrior. And for a moment, you forget it is your favorite memoir. And she reminds you of lilies or roses, Van Gogh or stems with thorns, art galleries in romantic cities where she is headed, but you should not go. And the flight attendant grazes my shoulder, the crossword squares, the letters, the chairs and aisles seem so tight in flight, but there is nothing here but room, really. Maybe the next passenger will know what I do not. 64 down, five letters, purpose. And why do we remember what we do? We know the buzz of Dickinson's fly and the number of years in Marquez's solitude but some things we will never know as it should be. Why the body sometimes rumbles like a plane hurtling over Southern Oregon. How exactly we fall in love. Or if Frida and Maxine Hong Kingston would have loved the same kind of tea. Okay. I think I'll just read two more and then see if there are questions. This is a new poem or a newer poem. Um, how many of you like food trucks or street food or open air barbecue, grills, that kind of thing? Okay. My people. <laughs> um, one time, so I was traveling. I've done a fair amount of traveling through Asia and Latin America. And somebody said, Mr. Herrick, aren't you worried you'll get sick? And I said, because I, I was in San Salvador, and I said, here's a, a mother and her daughter. It's their business, their family, their pride. They do this they, with love, with care. I've never been sick. And this is no knock on any teenagers, because I worked in a lot of fast food, but I'll trust that, you know, the pupusas over the, 16 year old make it my burger in the drive thru. This is on tape. Uh, <laughs> God bless the fast food workers, but please. Um, so I was asked to write a poem early in the pandemic, and thank goodness, you know, we're, we're moving this way. But probably two months into the pandemic, I, I was talking to Melissa, I couldn't write anything, but I was invited to write a poem by this organization called Boom California. It's the publication of the University of California system. And they said, would you write a poem about food and open space? And um, so I wrote this poem and it's, a, it's in a form for any writers out there. It's a very simple form called an abecedarian, which is just a 26 line poem where every line of the poem starts with the next letter of the alphabet. So 26 lines, 26 letters. It's called A.B. Sedarian Love Song for Street Food. And it has an epigraph from the late Anthony Bourdain who said, street food, I believe, is the salvation of the human race. All praise for the pozole glistening in midday light by the grace of the woman near the comal. In Southern California, Raul Martinez unveiled a mobile downtown gold mine of Al Pastor by a bar in East LA for the drunks, the artists, the necessary future waiting in line. Praise be to the ice cream truck, glory of the van's slow roll, so praise the van, hut, cart, booth, tent, stall, stand, bike, or truck. I once devoured a Tlaiuta in Oaxaca City, broke down 
just as the sunlight burst through the heart of a woman kissing her baby's forehead by the plaza. When I say love, what I mean to say is I dream of you through disaster, malady, drought, or that nightmare anxiety pandemic. But now, even in this late dying, let us praise the 20,000 open-hearted vendors in Bangkok and the glorious pupusas in San Salvador I ate on a bench near a dove. Quesadilla, arepa, dukboki, hallelujah. The bon mi right on the outskirts of Hue. The chili pepper, the cilantro songs, Praise the Zocalo saints who brought me to tears with a taco so full of music I almost wept. Under the Beijing moonlight, balsa is made by angels, vendors with wings if you know where to look. On West 53rd and 6th Avenue, New York City, halal. Or in Fresno, no xenophobe is welcome. Tell me what to eat. Your chuan, your elote, your mouthful of pure zen, like savory, surprising flashes of heaven. All right, and then one more short one. This will be the last poem I'll read. This, this is the last poem in Scar and Flower. Um, when my do my daughter is now 17, but when she was about three, she was reading and off kind of sitting on the floor reading a book. And I couldn't hear what she was saying, you know, but I could hear kind of some whispering. And I just started thinking about her future. So this is a sh just a short poem called The House is Quiet Except. My daughter reads on the couch, whispers the dialogue. I only hear the consonants of her name, the way I imagine a house of books in a future age, 2035, when I will be 65 and alive, I hope, and she will be 31, perhaps with faith, and the love she can count on. Wild trees, wild flowers, a man or a woman, perhaps God or someone else to whom she can whisper the dialogue if she forgets where her heart is, how there is a pulse in every book, how looking down into the open page reminds us of prayer the next night of restoration and the light around her body. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would be happy to take a question or any questions if there are some. Uh, yes, and then here and then here, yes. So you mentioned that like the door and it's doctor and the door and doctor. Yes. Now I actually have a cousin that's the word for it. She was born in China and she was a doctor at the time of the And I mean they were awesome about that up front. And you know, like, okay, they were actually, you know, through modest and she was you know, she looked up like, you know, her on end of three and she was actually, you know, trying to work in the agency practice and you're struggling with that. Mm. You know, one thing I'm a little curious about, like when you started like kind of trying to reach that Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and I have good wishes and energies for your for your relative. Um, so when I was growing up, the language of the time was more uh, this sort of thing: "Oh, we're all American." 
We don't see you as different. We're all the same. I don't see color, which I hope we all know now, although it's well intended, that's erasure. It compresses on the person of color, right? It's, and so there's that. Also, there was no DNA testing. There were no social media groups where you could connect with people like you anywhere around the world. There are only estimates say about 200,000 Korean adoptees in the entire world. It's a very micro population. So when I met the first adoptees, it was completely transformative and earth shattering. You have to understand it, it was earth shattering for me. Um, I didn't think about doing a birth family search until I was in my late twenties because of all of that talk. You're just like us. We don't see you as this. My name was Lee Herrick. I didn't have an accent. I even started to believe it. But then a lot of the racism that I experienced growing up started to make more sense. Oh, wait, I see these folks like my cousins. They don't see me like that. Right. So. A lot of surprises along the way. You know, I learned I wasn't born in the city I thought I was when I was about 30. Um, I went back to South Korea and, you know, we're all on different journeys, but boy, and, and I really don't like to tell people what to do and I'm not going to start now, but I will say for me, it was really meaningful to go back where I was born. Um, and poetry, you know, just to one more part of your question, uh, poetry and the arts can do everything. They're liberating. You can discover yourself. You can make meaning. You can recreate, invent. I can't stress enough how much poetry and literature and writing meant for my life. I, I just can't even begin to say how much poetry meant for me with my adoption and other things too. So yeah, I hope, I hope I answered. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, where do you get your inspiration to write? I mean, what's your muse? Yeah. Um, I mean, in one sense, um, uh, in one sense, family, travel, people, but there are two things really that I think of. And, and I should also say music. I'm a huge music person. Uh, one is anybody, a person, whether I know them or not, or whether I learn about them, somebody who's struggling and makes it through something. To me, that's the most inspiring thing. And choose the thing that I'm inspired by. You know, if you break down the etymology of the word inspire, it means to breathe in, like inspire, to spires, to breathe. I'm fueled and, and given oxygen by a number of different experiences. Adoptees, my oldest, closest friend has been sober for 30 years. Somebody raising a family, working 12 hours a day. Somebody coming back to college. Somebody going to college. Somebody turning in the paper when they're exhausted. Somebody closing shift at the rest. I mean, those kinds of things inspire me. I, I just can't say enough of that. And it, it fuels me. Um, the other thing is that um, I realized through this DNA test I took about five years ago, I have a hearing condition, which I always knew I had. And I always felt that I was a little different. Um, but now I know what it is and I have a name for it. And so sound is the other thing that inspires me. Um, I just, it would take a long time to explain, but I have some visceral, very painful reactions to certain sounds where I just sometimes have to leave the room or that line and how music stays in the body. I've become a, a ballad of wild dreams and coping mechanisms. I've learned to just make it through, you know, like there's an air duct or something heating. It's really noticeable and a rapper, so I just love the sounds of the natural world, the sounds around me. I'm just inspired by the sounds of people's voices, accents, you name it. That's a long way of saying I'm inspired by almost everything. <laughs>
Thank you. It's a good, good question. I hope I answered that. Did you have one? And then, did you have one earlier? Uh, that was basically the same as his. Um, so you would say that most of your uh, inspiration is from personal experience, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do we how do we take our personal experiences and expand as a writer or not? One thing I don't, I don't know. Does anybody here write a little bit? Journaling, songwriting, stories, poems. Some of you. Yeah. I. I there's a. There's a mantra or a, a, a tenet in creative writing that says, write what you know, which is good advice, I think. However, you can add to that. Richard Hugo, the great poet teacher, says in a book called The Triggering Town, he says, yes, you could write what you know, but then it might only be able to be so much. If you write about something you don't know, that has the potential to become anything. And so as an adoptee who didn't know a lot of the facts, you know, a lot of the, the facts surrounding my birth, I would just start to make things up. So yes, it's personal experience, but let your imagination be part of your personal experience and run wild with that. I mean, some of the greatest films ever made have been completely, maybe rooted in some experience, but imaginative, creative, outlandish almost. Perfect example, Star Wars. Think of the film Star Wars. I was a kid when that came out. I mean, Chewbacca? <laughs> you know what I mean? So don't limit yourself. The other thing I would say, um, I find great value in travel of any kind. If you've never been to that restaurant in Porterville or that city in Oakland or that town in LA, or you want to save up and take a trip to that country or whatever, that is expansive and helpful for our writing. And I think also for our lives. Yeah. Um, yes. And then. Are you thinking of one that really got on the laser sword of little fighter jet into space and blow the star? You know what? Here's a little fun story. You know George Lucas, the creator of Star Wars? Did you know that he's adopted? And he grew up and went to high school in Modesto, where I went to high school. Not the same high school. Um, people in Modesto are very proud of that. <laughs> yes? So I have a philosophical question. Sure. I'm just curious about your take on this. We have these discussions around campus about chat and and explicitly and with um, Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. You know, I, I, I have a lot of opinions on this and, and I'm glad that you're all thinking about it. I, I'll start with this angle of my thought and that is, you know, when the typewriter came along, people bemoaned what that would change. And then when the word processor allowed us to save it, and then when the phone was in the car, you remember the first cell phones? They were huge. Remember? Like, was a, you know, they were huge. And then in the phone, uh, in the, you, know, you can text. Um, and there's also always been um, a connection with ease and fear rooted in all technology. Uh, it'll make things easier um, and things like that. And a, Along with that, any technology in, in the public sphere is going to be uh, used by people that include the whole range of human emotions and motivations, including cheating. Um, and faculty or administration are, are, I think, reasonable to be concerned by that. You know, there was Turnitin and other things like that. It still is. But... 
as a writer or as a poet, yes, it could write iambic pentameter. Yes, it might even be able to approximate some kind of emotion. But great art, I'm talking about the films that make you weep every time, the song that makes you weep, the poem that moves you so much unexpectedly you could never possibly have imagined it, that has to come from an artist, that has to come from a person whose life experiences, trauma, joy, perseverance, migration, can never be duplicated by a computer, at least at this point. It, it just can't. It might take the astute observer, the eye, the really sharp reader, because to the, I, I couldn't tell the real Mona Lisa from a fake if I saw it, because I'm not an artist, you, you know? So, you know, what was it? A month afterwards, the student at Princeton developed the anti-chat GPT software. So it's always, in, it's always in flux, but for my money, art, writing, music, those great things are always gonna win out. Always gonna win out. Yes, and then, yes. When you write your poetry, is it a form of therapy? Or would you, um, if it is a form of therapy, do you ever take it to the dark side, like angst? Uh, any type of dark emotion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, and I don't even know if I call it the dark side. It's all the good side. The art, to me, you know, some po poets have said uh, there's really only two things that all poems are about, uh, love and death. Uh, I first started writing poetry after I was writing cheesy little rap songs. You know, a lot of anger, a lot of anger, uh, teachers, parents, cops, the system, you know, and it was just an outlet. Uh, when I was writing poetry, heartbreak, you know, that kind of sadness or that doubt. And we know, I, I should say this, I'm always mindful when I, when I bring this up, especially in a college setting. If anybody's in that frame of mind like I was, doubting there's a future because of a breakup, trust me, there is a future, okay? And I, you, I, you might not need to hear this. I'm gonna say it anyway. You don't have, what does Martin Luther King Jr. said? You don't have to know where the staircase is to know it's there, you know, just, okay. But the writing, I suppose, was therapeutic in a way. It made me feel good. Getting stuff out can feel good venting to a friend, writing something out. Yeah, but where that trans tr translates to the poet is more discipline, writing more consistently, not just in times of emotional upheaval, right? So it can change, but sure, there's always an emotional element to it in, in some case, in some ways, yeah. So to answer succinctly, it probably started off that way a little bit for me, but not as much anymore. Yeah, I mean, I'm 52, but there are still things that are challenging to write for me. We want to keep challenging ourselves, right? I remember when people older than me when I was in college would say things like I'm about to say to y'all. They'd say, we keep learning throughout our lives. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what the heck is that? What does that mean? Um, but it's true. You keep learning. So, yeah. I'm going to... Yes, my daily practice. Um, I read most days. I'm always thinking of lines. Um, I don't sit and write every day. I wish I could. I'll go a couple months without writing at all, but then I'll go on a tear. And everybody, I encourage you to realize, do it enough to when you know what works for you and what doesn't. That's how habits are formed as an, as an artist or as a any kind of person working, you know, if you're a morning person, evening person, you know, so I'll go months without writing and then I'll go on a week or two tear where I know I'm in a zone. And then I try to keep very little between me and the poem at that point. You know, family always comes first, but if I know things are going and poems are speaking to me, I try to really honor that. Yeah. Um, Dr. Habib, and then any students also. Yes, oh, President. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your poetry. It's been just 
Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I, I love that um, poem I just read, California. Mm. And I noticed that in that poem, that the last one, the first one and the last one that you read, you made a lot of references to the melting pot. Mm. You made references to our cultures, and I think it's so appropriate for the sense of that. So I, I really enjoy that. Oh, thank you. And then the question that I have is a silly question. I doubt that. Um, I also noticed that you include flowers, gardening, references of flowers in the poem called the Irish people. Mm. Are you a gardener? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a silly question. Um, I, yeah, this, the title actually of my second book is called Gardening Seekers of the Dead. I love doing yard work. I grew up mowing lawns in my neighborhood when I was like seven or eight in Modesto and in, in the Bay Area. My dad just said, go mow somebody's lawn, <laughs> you know, and I, I was always working. I used to live near some walnut orchards and I would, I always just loved being outside, but I'm definitely not a gardener. Um, I think of it more as cultivation and the natural world and physicality and just work and sweat. You know, I, I played soccer for four years in college and a very low level semi-pro. And so anything physical, hiking, I just love. So maybe that's where the gardening comes in. And then to the, I wanted to just mention the comment about our Cal, my California because you reminded me of something. Um, yeah, that there's that melting pot idea, or now we even, there's a, a way of, of thinking of it as we're all distinct and we remain ourselves, even though we're in the same world. Um, but my California, I see it that way, very diverse. I mean, this room is probably more diverse than some towns, you know, and I, I just feel at home in that, in this sort of environment. Um, but you remind me um, that part of my platform as California Poet Laureate is that I will be inviting all Californians, documented or not, free or not, any Californian, young, not so young, to write a poem about your town or your city or your California, right? What do you love about it? What joy do you find in it? Or what do you not love about it? Or what would you change about it? Or it could just be a poem that's rooted in your town, that's clearly about the town. And we're gonna be publishing all of those on the California Arts Council website. So if any of you are interested, we'd love to have your poems. It'll be up on the California Arts Council website, hopefully by June 1st. So if you want to look out for that, we'd love to have your poems. But um, thank you. And it's really a nice honor to have the president here. So thank you for the question. Yeah. A few minutes if there's any other students who might be wondering anything. Yes. Could be what in times of crisis? Helpful for, yeah. It's a great question. It's a great question. Um, one of the most meaningful things as a poet, um, and but even before this California Poet Laureate appointment, has been when I meet other Korean adoptees or anybody else who comes up to me and says something, or I get an email about something like that, what the poem meant to them. Um, I received an email probably about three or four months, months into the pandemic from a nurse. And if you can remember how unbelievably tragic, how many deaths in the hospitals, and the nurse said that her nursing staff couldn't cope. They were so distraught mentally that they were having a hard time coping. And they found a poem that I wrote 
that was published online called The Birds Outside My Window Sing During a Pandemic. And they had all started meeting once a week to read the poem and then write poems of their own and it helped them get through. I wrote one poem where a Korean adoptee had committed suicide and I'll say there's always help, support, support, but this, this person didn't make it and his fam some friends asked me to write a poem for him that they read at his service. As a writer, it's hard to tell. I don't ever write a poem thinking that's gonna happen, ever. I've never thought I wanna write a poem that will influence somebody or help somebody. But I wanna write as purely and honestly as I can. And if that happens, it's beautiful. If that happens, beautiful. I say wherever we get our inspiration, I need it too, you know? So yeah, I, I hope I spoke to that, but it's a good question. Thank you. Any, I do want to be mindful of the time, but I want to also, if anybody else, yes. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, most of my international travel was about a maybe a 15, 20 year span. The last time I was out of the country was Jamaica, and that was maybe five, six years ago. Um, only to the extent of seeing local bands and local music. I've never, I've performed some music and poetry festivals out of the country but not very often, but I love just local bands, street musicians, any and all languages. It's one of the things I miss most about travel. California and the United States in general, I don't think is very good with open public spaces and, and art, you know, sometimes here and there, but um, I think colleges do a lot of that sort of thing. Um, but as much local as I can, poetry, food, music. Um, I feel like I miss it now that she raised that question. I feel like I miss that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a different thing, ordering food, eating food, where the vegetables are local, the language is local. It's spiritual. California's great for that. It's a great food state probably a great food town, you know? Oh, boy. So, I mean, I'm partial, you know, South Korea is where I was born. Most of my travels been in um, Latin America and Asia. So the food, okay, do you like noodles, like pho? I mean, this is so Central Valley in California. You know what I mean? Uh, but so Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, I mean, ugh. <laughs> the food and the lines, a taco so full of music, the Zocalo Saints in Mexico City. I mean, the, the food in Mexico, Southern Mexico is where I was mostly Oaxaca, Chiapas, um, Peru, beautiful country, um, loved Peru, Bolivia. Guatemala, El Salvador, th those come to mind. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I'll just add briefly, um, some of you maybe travel a lot already, some of you maybe later in your lives. I didn't really start until I was 30, but one of the great things about being in a college, not only you've got friends and whatnot, but you've got ama an amazing president. You've got amazing faculty who have been around, seen things. They write, they support, they read, they teach. They want good things for you too. Um, so if you if you can, you know, ask those questions and, and continue to grow, whether it's travel or writing or anything else. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to take more, but I don't want to keep you over. I know this was meant to go till two. Mallory, I don't know how we're doing or how you're feeling or Melissa, but uh, what? Yes? Are, are there any others? 
Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you.